continuing on about music. If you didn't read the little blurb about myself, you probably know that I went to school originally to be a composition major, and look at what that got me. <laughs> Ultimately, I did go in for music, and of course it became a minor because, as I'm sure Karen knows, you spend enough time in music and you need to make it something in your degree, uh, because otherwise, oh my goodness, how much time you've spent on that. But it's always strange, isn't it? When we go to a concert and everyone claps, at the beginning, when? What usually, who usually comes out? <laughs> when the conductor comes out. Don't you think that might be a little strange to think about that? Because you're there to listen to the music, but if you're seeing somebody up there just go like this, and there's no sound or no musicians, what kind of a concert is that? Granted, there was such a concert in the 1960s when it was an experimental piece, and the, the person who was conducting at the front was to the room and the audience, whatever they spoke about, all the noises that were coming out of people in the audience became the orchestra. But who is really in charge in the orchestra can create this kind of dichotomy of musician versus conductor, composer versus musician and conductor. It just becomes a whole mess. But yet all of them at the same time are producing the music. You can't have an orchestra, you can't have a band, you can't have a choir without musicians. You can try without a conductor, but you might get off on time in different places, and so it's good to have somebody that just kind of takes that on. And, but often I think it's the clapping is not necessarily at a concert for the conductor. Sometimes it is. If you've seen the new film about Leonard Bernstein with Bradley Cooper playing, um, with, uh, playing Lenny, um, you'll notice that he is kind of the center, and of course it's a bio biographic, it's about him. And sometimes in our history we think that the people that are creating the music and the ones that are conducting it are in fact the face of the orchestra. Much like in the church, it's often to be thought that the face of the church is the one that wears all the fancy crap on Sunday. Forgive me, I didn't know if crap was a good word here. <laughs> but the face of an orchestra goes well beyond that of the conductor, just as the face of the church. I, for example, am one face among many. And for many of us that are in and a part of the church, the faces that make up the face of God are indeed the faces of Christ in which we share together. It's kind of strange sometimes to think that the success or the failure of ministry is on one person in that sense. Just as whether a piece of music great comes or flops based on the fact of one conductor or even one orchestra. We might need a little room for the Holy Spirit in the church to see beyond just one face. And for Lutherans, I think some of us, we say, we like to talk a lot about grace, don't we? We talk a lot of grace, we say it a lot, we explain it, but I think on some level, there's still this part of us that doesn't fully trust it. That instead, in a society, in a world where we are continually told that grace is transactional, that good things that happen to us are because we did something to receive it, that ultimately we lose sight of what God's grace, unconditional and free, is for us. When we look at our readings for this morning, we are reminded in Paul the very heart of this understanding of grace, that it is God's will for us that is a gift to be received. And... Yes, sometimes you give a gift for brownie points and other things like that, but most of the time, when we give a gift or we receive it, is it does it have attachments to it? No. If you said yes in your mind, okay, but <laughs> it's no. 
The point of a gift is that it's given freely and it's to be received freely. There isn't an attachment. If someone says, ooh, I don't like that label maker, Seinfeld, and you give it away to somebody else, there shouldn't be an issue, right? So why in any universe would God have a problem for us to be receiving of grace and not be able to give that back? But we have an image in the text, not one that I conveniently left out today, but I wanted to tell you about this morning. In the Gospel of John, we hear about Moses who lifted up the serpent, and that may have caught your eye. One of the verses that we normally read for this Sunday is a little problematic, more than a little problematic. The Israelites have been, or the Hebrews, have been walking around the wilderness, and some of them are grumbling and wondering, what is God up to? What is God wanting us to do? Why have you let us out here? And God... According to the scripture, it tells us that God sent snakes among those people, and they were all sick, and many of them died. Then, because the people come to Moses and say, what can we do? We have sinned greatly, something like that. Moses is told by God to make a snack, a graven image, and put it up so that people, when people see it, they will be healed. Do you remember this story? We read it every year. <laughs> It's highly problematic, isn't it? And it's not just problematic for the ways in which the story of trying to figure out that that is God, but this is an old way of understanding grace. This is not, to be very clear, the Jewish way of understanding grace, because that same God of Jacob is the same God in Christ that we believe in. Let me make that very clear. But maybe or wrestling with the idea of God's grace is not so much in what we receive from God, but what we hear around us, what we see around us, this transaction that says, if we are not worthy, bad things happen to us. We need that constant reminder in the gospel that God always comes to us in life. And the idea that God wants us to die, but yet give us eternal life is highly problematic. It's even to the point today where when Paul comments on the life of faith, that we understand that grace is given to us because God sees us as what he wants us to be. He is what he has made us, set apart for good works. Because what we are wrestling with in all of this is in a sense of what the Holy Spirit would have us not see, but hear. How many of you read silently at this point? Most people, right? In about 300 years ago off, reading was mostly done out loud. That the act of reading is in and of itself an act of hearing as well. And of course, we can understand from a point of view of reading that we are hearing it somewhere within us. We have the words, but it's not exactly the same. It doesn't pick up on that sense that God has given us in these ears to hear. It even creates a bit of a problem for the medieval church, who is so focused on sights. Our own church, as I've remarked this morning, and a couple others may have, I think Mary did, that the church used to be all about image and sights and sounds and smells, and you have this experience that, ins- that assaulted, essentially, many of your senses, especially if you cannot deal with incense and al- have allergies to it. But what people were doing in the medieval church, and Luther had a problem with this. He had a lot of problems with a lot of things. But he had a problem specifically in Wittenberg and the idea that people would go in Erfurt, from pe- that people would go from mass to mass, feeling unworthy to be able to take communion, to take the holy communion that is set before them and transfigured into the body of Christ before them. Because not only were they unworthy of it, but because they believed that even if they were unworthy, catching a sight of the very real Jesus in front of them was not only a miracle, but that would be the gift of belief. Obviously, we get this from even John himself, who in this scripture goes on and on about seeing as believing. 
of course, we realize now that it is in the partaking of communion, not just looking at it, that God commends to us belief as well. The Gospel of John poses a bit of a problem for us in this way, too, that we try to wrestle with the sense of God's grace being one for the Jews and one for the Christians. Paul might have a problem with this. But John is constantly obsessed with the idea of light and being in vision and seeing, and it is so remarkable, then, that the greatest transformation of belief happens towards the end, the end of the Gospel. And I may be a few weeks ahead here, but we'll point to it. In the sense that when Jesus comes among the disciples, who is not with them the first time? Thomas. Yep, Thomas. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. But it's there where Jesus says to Thomas and Christ effectively says to us what the gospel is trying to hit at and affirm in us that those of us who have not seen yet have come to believe, also have the same belief. Because Jesus even says to Thomas, have you only believed because you have seen me? And it creates a problem for us, thinking that because we don't see Jesus in the world, that maybe we're not receiving the real thing. But granted, just as the prophets had, just as anyone has, the hearing of the Spirit is what anchors us and causes our belief. It's a transformation from seeing to hearing. So now do we hear grace in the church? It may seem very obvious, but we have to move sometimes to thinking that we have to see, instead of seeing results, the way that our world tells us we need to see good. And I don't know about you, but it feels like the world is on fire right now. And seeing that all the time may make us wonder where God is and whether or not we're getting it wrong or whether or not God is truly active in our lives. But if we take an example from the orchestra, if God can be sometimes through the conductor or through the musicians and give us the room, can give us all the things that create the music, God is also giving us the most important part of this, which is the score and the music itself that all are listening to in order to produce it. Do you know that God gives you grace? and gives all of us unconditional grace. So that the music that we are producing in this world, the music that is being conducted sometimes by lay leadership, sometimes by ordained, sometimes being played, and sometimes, if you're like a trumpet player like myself, you're resting in it. To make that note, brass players don't play a lot in orchestral music, <laughs> unless you're playing Wagner. So rest assured that what we are listening for is that word of grace, is that trusting word that helps us, propels us in the gospel to believe that Christ is in and among us, and that we are playing the tune that God has set. Amen.